Safety Veterans Subcommittee. Um, I like to call this meeting to order. And doing so, I like to actually call a, um, a potential um, um, call to um, E session. I don't know, what is it called? Um, executive session, if we need to, um, tomorrow at 845, um, if possible. I mean, if we need it during the um, interview of the judges. So saying that, um, all those, do we have to vote on that? Or can I, can I just call that? Okay, so I'd like to entertain a motion to have. Um, so moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All, right. All those opposed? Thank you. Motion moves. Call to the public. We have a, three cards. The first card is um, Leonard. Come on down. Thank you for letting me. Thank you for letting me speak. I'm not sure if this mic is on, but that's not a problem. You know, I've got a loud voice, so uh, I'm just very concerned right now. As you all know, with the the heat that we're having, I know it's Phoenix. Everybody says, "Hey, I'm hardcore. I live through the heat," but I'm concerned about the people who are elderly, sick, who are more prone to uh, heat illness. Uh, not far from where I live in District One, a couple months ago, maybe not quite two months ago, a, a person was found passed away on a mountain trail with hot, you know with water but they were hiking in the middle of the day I grant you that but with the recent reports in the media in the area I believe by the corner of all the heat related deaths and injuries uh, you know I'm just hoping in your subcommittee I know there's the environmental subcommittees and these types of subcommittees where uh, you're pushing for more shade and this type of thing uh, so I just hope we, we can really really start to focus on that um, you know because uh, whether you believe in global climate change or not, our temperatures are increasing. And if we want to continue to have uh, the city of Phoenix stay a very livable and enjoyable city, then uh, we need to start doing something because people are starting to take notice now. All this talk in the air about the two-year drought, I mean, uh, uh, rationing in two years, possibly all these things is only going to hurt our property values, our businesses, when people start saying, man, it's so hot there, I don't know if it's worth going there. So I'm hoping that we can do all of these things that will uh, increase our our public safety and then the second thing is I agree with Councilman Nowakowski in the past and some of you might agree with him the other cities need to start stepping up and helping us with our homeless brothers and sisters okay I have as much sympathy as everybody does it is not fair for the city of Phoenix to to take the total cost I'm calling out Tempe uh, Mesa all of the surrounding cities I'm not sure what's going on at the Maricopa As Association of Governments I'm not sure if that's in their purview but could you please push for that because this is really not a fair situation to our homeless brothers and sisters who have to try to make it to our central Arizona service uh, system uh, and uh, the taxpayers, everybody. So thank you so much for letting me speak. Already we have John, I think it's Phillips. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Don Robbie. We live in the Boulder Ridge Manufactured Home Park, a 55 and over community um, located Don, I'm on sorry to interrupt you, but this is called to the public. It was actually John um, Phillips. Okay. Sorry about that. Don't, don't try to get my time. Oh, no, not, not at all. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll yield the additional time to Don. To, um, uh, I'm John Phelps, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of the State Bar of Arizona. And I'm here uh, on behalf of uh, one of your municipal court judge applicants, uh, Frankie Jones. And I don't know if this is, this is the time you expected to hear comments from the public about candidates, but uh, if it is, uh, I would just like to um, share with you the many years of service that uh, Ms. Jones has given to the State Bar in a number of different capacities. She served. Uh, on our professionalism committee, our unauthorized practice of law uh, committee. She served on a number of Supreme Court task forces, uh, really looking at the professionalism and ethical conduct of lawyers, uh, and is uh, a, a true um, leader within the uh, legal profession here in Arizona. So I, I wanted to say just a quick few words of support and, uh, and share with you uh, our experience with Ms. Jones, uh, as I know you will be considering her among the applicants today. Thank you so Thank much. You. We have J.J. Johnson. Good 
Mayor, Council, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, I wanted to speak about the LRAD. Now I know that that's been taken off the uh, taken off the agenda, and I don't care. It's not off my mind. The LRAD is a weapon, uh, and it's not just my opinion. United States District Court Judge from the Southern District of New York, Robert Sweet, ruled that the LRAD is a weapon. Uh, from Pennsylvania to Pittsburgh, or from, from Pittsburgh to uh, Philadelphia, judges are saying that this is a weapon. Now, I don't know what sort of, you know, what sort of after school special y'all had with Tempe PD out, out, outside the scrutiny of the public. It is a weapon. At 150 decibels, you are starting to create permanent damage to hearing. And my challenge for the council is this, before you consider this again, you need to talk to your occupational health and safety people within the city because what you're allowing officers to do or what you're potentially allowing officers to do is to permanently maim people. We cannot allow that. With the ethical and factual elasticity that we have seen in this procurement process, we cannot allow that. You need to make every document from between LRAD and Chief Williams publicly available now. We deserve to have transparency, not the opacity that we've dealt with with this police department. Thank you, Chair Jan. And we're on an item that's it for um, call to the public. We're with the uh, minutes, the last minutes of um, June 12th. Has anybody reviewed those? And I move approval. Right, we have a motion. Second. We have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. We're on consent item number two. Move approval. Can't turn down a donation like this. <laughs> second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on this matter? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. So now we're on item number three, and basically not, item number three is for information only. That's three through five. I'm not sure if anybody wants to pull any of those items out to get extra additional information. I know that most of us got informed at, at the council level. Um, I think, didn't the gentleman you called up mistakenly, wasn't he, he has, here to talk about this? Yeah. I could be wrong. Oh. All right. So I like to pull out items okay. three and five so that they can, we have cards on those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can actually, anybody needs information on item number four? The charity, uh, the fire department's charity contribution process. Okay. See, seeing that, we're on item number three. We have, um, Steve Graham. I only need to speak if you need information you want to ask me. Already. Then we also have JJ Johnson. If we're considering anything at all about any change to the diversion program uh, for domestic violence abusers, we need to really err on the side of the victim. Uh, I am profoundly uncomfortable with the current posture that it is assumed that a domestic abuser will go into a diversion program and not really suffer any long-term consequences. We need to secure convictions. We need to remove the gun rights from people who commit domestic violence, uh, uh, domestic violence incidents because the day is coming when you are going to wake up, pull out your iPad in the morning, and you're going to end up spitting your, your cornflakes all over your iPad because somebody that went through this domestic violence diversion program has committed some atrocity, has gone back and killed the person that they victimized in the first place, or shot up a school. It is a matter of time before we have a critical failure in this diversion program. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Steve, I'm not sure if you, you feel that you need to speak on this. Yeah. 
I'm Steve Grams. I'm with Sage Counseling, and we run the diversion program. I think it's been about 10 years we've had that contract. Uh, caring about the rights of victims is really important with all the work you do in criminal justice, particularly with domestic violence, which is why it's good to have a program that does treatment. If you want to reduce recidivism and avoid tragedies of people committing violence against somebody else, using treatment to help reduce that risk is a smart thing to do. That supports victims. Convictions and uh, jail time do not serve as a good deterrent for most criminal behavior, and particularly not domestic violence in uh, couple relationships. So overall, treatment is a more effective deterrent, and sometimes the two together. And you need the criminal justice side to force people to go to treatment, but treatment is effective with an awful lot of clients. So. Thank you. Then we have item number five, Don. Before he speaks. Uh, Absolutely. We, uh, so we have, I think the fire department is here to speak about this, so uh, maybe. Would you like to he, ask questions? Well, maybe fire? he goes first and then they can talk about the things he wants to talk about. Why don't you have him go first? All right. And then he can always come back up and ask questions, right? Yeah, absolutely. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, once again, my name is Don Robbie. Uh, we live in the Boulder Ridge Manufactured Home Pro uh, Park, a 55 and over community lo located on Barron Drive, right next to the Cave Creek and Beardsley Roads quarry. In uh, 1999, Mayor Rimza announced that the quarry was being donated and was going to become a city park. For the past 20 years, the story's been, yeah, it's there, but in a couple years, it's going to become a park, so don't worry. Um, well, with the arrival of Southwest Rock Products about a year and a half ago, that changed, and uh, the story has been proven to be a lie. They have aggressively conducted more frequent and stronger blasts with plumes of dust, sometimes so dense you can't see the mountain. Dust and diesel fumes rain down on us constantly. Sure, living in the desert, you expect dust. But this stuff isn't desert. It's the consistency of large particles that have an almost oily texture. It covers everything. It gets into everything. As mining operations increase, so have health issues. Even our animals are contracting valley fever. We don't know what we're breathing and whether the dust contains cancer-causing silica particles thrown off in the blasting, grinding, and hauling of the granite being used for road building and landscaping. Damage to our homes is increasing. We have complained to our elected officials, to the mine, and others. We're told we're old and our lung and kidney problems can't be traced to the quarry. We're told that our uh, photographs offered as proof of the blowing dust could have been photoshopped. The damage to our homes could have been pre-existing and due to houses settling and are not a result of their blasts, we're told. It boils down to they were here first, they have a permit to make dust, they have more than enough money to pay any fines they incur, they seem to have advanced knowledge of when inspectors are going to be present, and any inspector who has taken an interest in our complaints is magically transferred. Want me to continue? You can just wrap it up. Uh, can I come back later? If a council member calls you up for questions. Okay. Absolutely. One thing I would say is that uh, the code, gentlemen, is not being enforced. Um, they're supposed to be pre-blast survey and post-blast surveys. They have not happened. Thank you. Can you ask the fire? Do we have time? Yeah, absolutely. Fire. May I ask a couple of questions? Absolutely. Unless somebody else has. Uh, so, chiefs. Uh, I've talked to you guys about this in the past. I think the mine's been there since 1951, roughly. So, long time. Um, uh, you guys go out and monitor the blasting. Is that correct? But, uh, 
Chairman, members of the council, correct. We go out there and we are out there doing every mine um, blasting operation that happens. The Phoenix Code is three times as tough, I guess, as the national or international standard that I think the state uses. Is that accurate? Uh, 2.5, I believe. 2.5, two and a half times tougher. So Phoenix has gone way beyond what you might get in other municipalities or around the country. Correct, sir. Um, the damage is reported to who? If somebody claims that there's damage, is that the fire department? I'm going to defer to Assistant Chief sure. Scott Walker, who manages this area, sir. Good morning, Chairman Okowski, members of the subcommittee. So specific to that question, what happens is um, if there's damage that occurs, um, we are notified typically through a complaint process. Um, we will then put a hold on the permit for that blaster. We will investigate if there were damage happened, why it happened, or if they exceeded the limitations. Um, we will, if, if, to this point, we have not been notified of damage that we've had to do this. But when there's been other uh, complaints, this is the process we use. We find out, measure it through seismograph, did it happen, and then we work with the blaster to find out why it happened and what they're going to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. Sometimes we require them to not go as close to the edge of the property um, and or get an engineer to review their plan for the next blast to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, the Obviously, the uh, our what we call um, permit to blast requires that the blaster has a liability insurance of $1 million. So if there were damage to a structure, the owner of that property would have recourse through that process. It would not really be something we facilitate or coordinate the, um, the management of, of how that's re re resolved. Uh, Mr. Chair, so, so I, I might have missed something. You talked about the process, but did I hear you say you actually haven't had it in this particular mobile home park or? So for us, yeah, we have heard that, you know, there are uh, cracks and dryways and those types of things. That's not something the fire department takes on as far as did it, was it caused by the blast? Um, the information we have, as you said, we are more than uh, twice as restrictive as the national standard. And so the information we have, there should not be damage occurred from that according to the, the science out there. Um, if, in fact, if someone believes that there was damage on that, again, we wouldn't have the capacity to say it was or was not caused by the blast. That was something they could work with the insurance company of the blaster themselves, how we would refer that to them. So we aren't, there hasn't been specific uh, damage as far as rocks flying into vehicles, like actually was seen a, a few decades in the East Valley and things like that, where there's real tangible, we could say the blast caused this damage. Um, and that's how we would refer it to that complaint and if, there was, if they uh, believe the damage was caused by the mine or the blast. So from your perspective, there has been damage at other mines around the valley, but the, the tangible stuff that you could be like, yep, that was definitely caused, broken windshield from a rock flying or something, you haven't seen any of that here. I can say in the last several years, um, obviously I don't know historically uh, 10, 20 years ago, but I know since this issue has come to light over the last few years, that is correct. We have not seen any tangible damage where we would know and say um, this caused that damage. If that were the case, we would suspend the permit and we would require them to remedy that and resolve that with that um, small, uh, the owner of the property. Also make sure, tell us how they're going to ensure that doesn't happen again. And I've met with you several times on this, so I think my memory is correct because it hasn't been that long. You've actually sent people out to monitor the blasting while it's happening. We are at, uh, at complainants' homes. I don't know if it was this gentleman's home, but other people's homes. That's correct. We are on site at every blast. Um, they are, the blasters are required to monitor the seismograph, um, uh, basically energy in the ground to determine if it met the threshold or exceeded the threshold. We have, when there's been an issue, a homeowner has brought up a complaint, we'll actually have somebody, one of our fire prevention inspectors at that home to really assess that. We have required the blaster to put these seismographs actually in the complainant's um, yard or home to measure what the damage is um, at, uh, or the energy is at that home. So we are very proactive in ensuring that that's not happening. Um, it is important to understand that most of the um, regulations or requirements are within the 500 feet of the blast um, area um, because that's where the science and standards say that's where these uh, the damage can happen at these levels. When you get out at 500, or beyond 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 feet, all science says the level we are requiring won't result in damage. Now, again, I'm not saying that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that's what the science and the technology tells us. I assume they're independent tests. It sounds like those aren't things that you guys did as a department. You're operating off of. Uh... 
Yes, sir. Some it's national standard. The, or something. Obviously, blasting is a very technical science done with engineers that design these blasts and these thresholds. So it's there, yes, a third party, not us telling telling anyone that. And you use an engineering firm, uh, Mr. Chair, engineering firm to to monitor this. Is that what I recall? Uh, so the fire department doesn't actually require the doesn't uh, have the engineering firm. The blaster has people out there that has that, and they give us those reports. Uh, but you've actually. I don't know about you personally, but fire department officials have been out for some of the more recent blasting. That is correct. Uh, our command officers that manage fire prevention section were on site, I believe, either the two or three blasts ago. We video some of the blasts. Um, they're standing typically two to 300 feet away from the blast itself and video to really kind of get a sense of perspective of, of what the blast oh. is. You know, we, we obviously want to deal with any concerns or issues the community has, and um, we very actively do this and enforce that. So we're out there every time, we video it, and those reports come back to myself, and the fire chief is aware of those as well. And so, I mean, you heard his, we're sitting over there, so I assume you heard the charges, sounds too strong, but the issues that he raised. So one of them was, you know, they know you're coming, so, you know, they, they change how much they're blasting, I guess was the implication. No. no. Oh, all right, I'm sorry, I'm misinterpreting. What, what did you say? Well, when an inspector, Why don't, why, don't, why don't maybe he could come up to the, the mic? If you'd like to come to the microphone, so. I'm sorry to misinterpret what you said. No, that's, that's Trying okay. Trying to do the best I could. Um, I remembered. The fire department has been there. We didn't know that we're supposed to be contacting you if there's any damage. Um, you may want to find somebody else that we should contact because there's a lot. Um, they've gone down to the water table. So they can't go any further down. Now they're going to the side. They're going to the property line, which is also our property line. When they blast, they're blasting the same rock strata that our homes rest on. Our homes are jumping, all, just all kinds of things. Um, so your seismographs um, are picking up what they're picking up, but I think that you're going to find that it's going to become more intense. Okay, I, oh, I I'm sorry. Um, and my point, I'm sorry, my point was that um, your code says that they're supposed to, the blast contractor is supposed to go to the homes 500 feet radius from the blast site and do a pre-blast survey and then come back after the blast and check to see what has changed in doing a post-blast survey. None of that's being, being done or has been done, and so therefore there's no baseline that we can say, well, this is what's changed. We're told, oh, that, that was pre-existing or the result of your house settling. So I guess could you respond to all that? Yes, Chairman Nikowski, Mayor of the Committee, Vice Mayor Waring. Uh, specifically, um, as far as the question of the pre- and post-blast survey, um, this is really a point of clarification. The code is, doesn't require it for every blast. The code requires a pre-blast survey, which we have been documented has been done before the blasting occurred several years ago. As long as the blasting continues, when the blaster is done blasting, they are then required to do the post-blast survey and do the assessment to see if anything uh, changed in there and then remedy those. So that's really a point of clarification. So it's not after each individual blast, it's after a series of blasts. That's correct, when their permit expires. But someone like, like these folks could complain somewhere in the middle of that. They can complain at any time. They can complain at any like, time, is that and, fair? And I would say, and I will clarify, we really don't want to be the, um, in the middle of their complaint. There is, the, again, the code requires the insurance policy by the blaster. That's really their best remedy is to follow up with that blaster and, that, and the uh, insurance company. We would just be facilitating or connecting them anyway. So um, that's what we would prefer that to happen. Uh, you know, they talked about dust and so forth. I know you talked earlier about the science. I don't know enough about blasting to know. Um, my grandfather used dynamite to blow up a stump once on our family farm. Other than that, that's about the extent of my knowledge of this particular topic. Uh, it was really a formative experience, very exciting. Um, but also one time, not all the time. Um, <coughs> So what, 
I guess I'm looking for like, how do we resolve this? It sounds like you're relying on the fact that there's an uh, international code, we've upped it two and a half times. They probably, I think in our discussions before, if we made it five times or three times or whatever, they just wouldn't be able to blast, which I'm sorry to the people who live there, but they were there way before the mobile home park. Uh, that's putting private enterprises that were there way before you. That doesn't seem like justice either. So from my perspective anyway, I can't speak for my colleagues. I don't know if we could really do that anyway. Um, so how do we reconcile Chairman How do we reconcile these two conflicting goals? Chairman Nolacas, Member Subcommittee, a couple uh, things I can add to that is um, when we've been there, as I said, we are there every time. Um, we do video, and the videos I have don't show a significant dust uh, going in the air when we're there because, and they have a water truck. As soon as the blast happens, the water truck drives by to hold the dust down. You've got video of now, every single blast. I don't have video of every blast. We video, um, you know, about every other, so we have some reference. Um, but you're, you're doing half of them. <laughs> yes, and, and not specifically on that as well. The fire code doesn't um, address dust issues. Maricopa County environmental quality is very, very strict on dust issues. So if that's an, an issue for the residents, or certainly a remedy, I believe, there for them would be the appropriate remedy because they will enforce dust issues. Um, uh, I, that I know personally they'll do. Um, I would also like to clarify another point is uh, as far as the notifications. The code doesn't specifically require every person to be individually notified. It, it basically needs a good intent by the blaster to do that within 500 feet of the blast. Um, some of the people that have brought up these issues are outside of that, so they really aren't inside the code requirement to be notified. What we do, uh, and the blaster is doing to notify is, they are, and we have verification, we see it, is they are posting uh, notices on the mail, air, the common mail areas where people mm -hmm. drive by. Understand there's really only about one, one main road in there, so it's, at least it's focusing yeah, people familiar. down. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, postings on that. They are notifying the manager of the apartment complex to the north of the blast. We have now asked that they notify the manager of the mobile home park, I believe is this gentleman, um, so he can be aware of that and let the residents know that a blast is occurring. So. Um, that's the efforts that are happening to make sure no residents are notified within the 500 feet. But the code doesn't require every person to be individually every time be notified. Okay, so they're not saying a mailer to every single house. They're basically contacting someone like this gentleman, and then that is correct. And then, then it's kind of their responsibility to post it. Okay. Uh, okay, this was for information, so yeah. we're not changing anything today. Even if we wanted to change something today, um, we couldn't. I wasn't on this committee. I think you heard this. In the spring, for which I'm grateful, because uh, it has been complaints from, from my area, so I appreciate that. I mean, there's nothing we can do today. Happy to have further dialogue, and I appreciate you guys sitting through these questions with, with the chiefs and, uh, and this gentleman. We've done this with at least one other resident uh, where I was also present, and I think I've had you know three complaints. I think it was three. So, um, so maybe we'll do that. Maybe we could set up a meeting if you, if you guys want to either set it up or, or something, and we'll just see what else we could possibly do. It's only posted for information, so <coughs> so you guys understand we couldn't do something today anyway, talking to the residents. Um, oh, yeah. uh, excuse me. But, um, maybe she could fill out a card. Are you, are you asking questions? Well, uh, I was asking the chiefs to speak with them kind of offline. So uh, maybe you guys could, could right now, so it's not phone calls and stuff. Um, set up a time and either I'll try to be there myself or um, have a staffer, but I mean, this is the chief of the department and the person who oversees this project is also a chief. So uh, I don't know who else we would really talk to. I'm open to suggestions. Yeah. So the mayor would like to. I have a question on something you said. When you get the permit is when you go out and do the initial, um, I don't know if it was, the, Seismic, graphic damage, or quality, or whatever that sound was. Chairman Okowski, Mayor Wim, yes. Uh, when the initial permit is applied for, they're required to do a pre blast survey. That's where they're making an assessment of the structures and have a baseline to compare after the blasting is done. The, you don't do it then again during the permit process, the allowance, the time allowance? Uh, the code requires that once the blasting is complete, and so uh, blasting every 30 days, they renew the permit. It's automatically renewed as long oh, as there's okay. been no issues. When that blaster is done, blasting, then they're required to then do the post-blast survey. That way they have 
it, it encapsulates that blaster's period. So different blaster uh, could come in, and so they want to make sure that that blaster is responsible for the damage they may have caused, if any. So when they are complete on their permit and cancel all the permit, post blaster if it would happen, and that's what the okay. assessment we've done. Because I, I, I interpret what you said as you did it in the beginning, uh, and they were blasting in the middle, and then, as he said, they moved towards the perimeter. I didn't realize you continued to do that. I misinterpreted what you said. Sorry. Chairman Ocasio, Mayor Williams, yes, they do bl obviously blast in different parts of the site. Um, they have agreed to hold back from 200 feet from their property line to try to uh, minimize this impact to the residents. Um, but it is not, uh, the post blast survey is when that blaster is done with their, their period of blasting. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I say something? Absolutely. Uh, I shouldn't, I just don't want to mislead anybody. So when I say dialogue, I'm continuing to take complaints um, and, and speak to the chiefs and so forth and see what can be done. That shouldn't be interpreted as we are going to put the mine out of business or anything else. You, you moved right next to a mine and they're doing mine stuff. So at some point, I, I don't know that you can blame, uh, the elected officials were mentioned before. I don't know if you can blame us for that. That So, um, so uh, I don't, we don't, I don't think we have any real recourse. We could, I guess, change the code, which it sounds like would probably put them out of business because they couldn't get down to the levels that that's possible. But that would be radically different from what I'm hearing from the chiefs from the entire rest of the country, if not the world. I forget, was it an international or a national standard? Chairman Nokowski, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Waring, it's a national standard. National standard. So. The rest of the United States would have one standard and we'd have a dramatically heightened standard. We've already got that now. There might be other municipalities who are doing what we do, but we're probably an outlier. So um, at some point, I'm not guaranteeing everybody's going to want to be happy, but we'll do what we can. And we'll certainly continue to take complaints and you guys will continue to monitor. And, you know, one side saying that there's lots of dust and so forth, but you've got video of half the blast. Okay, I'm happy to see it. So bring it the next time we meet. Council member, um, sorry about that. Council member, a recommendation would be also to call the um, county um, dust control to be a part of that meeting if you you are planning a future meeting. Okay. Is that is it? Any other questions or concerns? Yes, Chief. Chairman Nowakowski, uh, Vice Mayor Waring, we will definitely facilitate a conversation with the folks in this room today, and then we'll give them the resources to report um, dust issues to the county, phone numbers, et cetera, to have what further recourse that they may have. Thank you. Council Member Mayor, Bill Cooper. All righty. We'll continue to item number six. Item number six is basically our neighborhood block watch grant program application guidelines and process. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of subcommittee, Assistant Chief Louis Tovar here to present this item, requesting council approval for significant changes made to the 2019 neighborhood block watch grant application and to the process itself as recommended by the Neighborhood Block Watch Oversight Committee. Uh, the application period is scheduled to open on November the 1st. So we're here to present those changes and possibly answer any questions is the chair of that committee, Carmen Arias, and representing the Police Department and our Fiscal Management Bureau as our Grants Administrator, Stacey Osborne. Thank you. Carmen? Good morning. Sure. Good morning, Councilman and Chairman Mawakowski, Mayor Williams. Congratulations, and Vice Mayor who ran away from us and Councilwoman Mendoza. Welcome to the council. You're my council person, by the way. <laughs> in May of 2018, the committee formed a subcommittee to review the block watch guidelines, which pass out to the different block watch groups so that they can present their request for funding. We met, they met, we met for a little bit over three months and came up with many revisions, which are in front of you. And so we're here today to request approval for those revisions. And if you have any specific questions on anything, I'd be happy to answer them. I don't want to go over every single one. Right. Any questions for my colleagues? Our mayor? I'm going to do the cards first. Okay, we have one card. Um, Candace? Okay, then I'll do that. Good 
Good morning. My name is Candace Freebow. I live in the John Left Long neighborhood called Moon Valley Gardens, which was established in the late 60s. I started with my neighborhood getting involved with some of these issues in 1992 with Skip Rimza, who was our council person. So I do have a long standing history of working with the city and the grant process. I served five years on the oversight committee. These recommendations that are being put forward, I could support the majority of them, but I do have some concerns with regards to the staff recommendations. Um, back up on items number 12 and 13 under the committee recommendations, the restriction items chart. The entire grant is supposed to be focused on crime prevention and safety related, and we're putting a dollar value limiting what we can do or purchase with crime prevention and safety giveaways for our neighborhoods and communities. Um, another concern that I have is um, removing the appeals process. There were some changes to our grant funding for my neighborhood community as well as our Black Mountain Community Alliance. And we were cut to stay within a cap that was not justified. And we were not given any explanation as to why our grant that was awarded was reduced by nearly $1,000. So it is limiting our ability to support neighborhoods and communities in the Black Mountain Precinct. So those are my per our concerns. The other one is staff recommendations, number one, which is changing the, the application process to close, changing it to a Thursday from the Sunday. For those of us that are involved in our communities, grant applications start in early December. They go from Thanksgiving, basically, until New Year's. So that is a busy, busy season for everyone personally. So having that additional weekend in, in January gives us as neighborhoods an additional three to four days of writing time, whereas it's only buying one day work day for fiscal staff. I appreciate what fiscal does. Thank you. Thank you, Candace. Regarding those issues, the time, the extra two to three days to write out the, um, the grants, Sure. Can you address that for us, please? Sure. Chairman Nowakowski, Mayor Williams, Councilwoman Mendoza. <laughs> uh, regarding the change, uh, it actually was an alteration uh, suggested by the Oversight Committee to change the date to a Sunday. It has been a Thursday at 4 o'clock for the last several years. Uh, mainly the reason that staff is requesting that it be put back to what it has been over the last few years is the number of phone calls that we get on that Thursday that it closes, anywhere from 30, 35 phone calls, and those phone calls take anywhere from 10 minutes to 30 minutes with staff actually walking the grantees through the process, through the electronic process to ensure that the grant application gets submitted by the deadline. In the grant application guide, it specifically states that if the grant is not submitted by the deadline, it is disqualified. So staff does everything we can to help those grantees make sure that they get it submitted by the deadline. Additionally, the next day on Friday, there are sometimes issues with uh, the grantees not being able to get their attachments attached to the application. So staff then helps them with that. We don't touch the application the day after the deadline, uh, but we definitely are there to help them with that process. Uh, those grantees that are more familiar with the process have an easier time of doing it, uh, but those that are new uh, definitely struggle. We also have application um, workshops that we do periodically during that month that the application process is open. So we're trying to do everything we can to be there to support the grantees. And the other issue was the um, cutting of the funds. And that was a decision made by the Oversight Committee, so I'll let Carmen answer that one. We have established limits on how much the committee thinks is appropriate to spend on various items. As a committee and as the subcommittee, uh, we felt that it was important that we maintain those limits for all the grants. So if, 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 if we felt, if the committee said that you could only spend $3,000 for an item, then you should only be allowed to spend $3,000 for an item just because you have a greater need than another group. Possibly we could write that into the next uh, oversight. I just uh, have one more question, then I'll uh -huh. pass it on to my colleagues. Is um, So this oversight committee, is mm -hmm. it made up of um, officers or 
the oversight committee, we have uh, we have an officer that represents the city of Phoenix Police Department, and we also have members from every block, every uh, council district. Okay. So we have we have our, our our goal is to have at least two members from every council district. Regretfully, we don't quite meet that goal, but we're working on that. Right. Mayor. Uh, I, I have a question on the the three thousand and the three thousand. Mm -hmm. Do all of them carry the message of crime prevention in some fashion? Depending on what the item is. For example, if it's uh, light bulbs for a, a, a garage outside, okay. no, they would not carry it. If they have any printed materials, yes, it is required to show that. Uh, first of all, that the, the the money is funded by the city of Phoenix, and also that it is for crime prevention. So if it was a pencil, right, it would have a message on it. Yes. All right. I That's a requirement. Uh, and then on the other, on the uh, changing the date, if you're concerned about making sure that staff is available, which sounds reasonable, could you then ex extend by an extra week the time to submit an application? that takes it just out, makes it more convenient? Chairman Olkowski, Mayor Williams, that was actually a consideration. However, because of the timeline, wanting to ensure that the oversight committee has enough time to score. So initially, the grant uh, staff in the police department review every single application to ensure that it meets the guidelines before those applications go to the oversight committee for scoring. Uh, we make notes on those that have items that either have exceeded the prohibited or restricted item list, that type of thing. Once we review all of them, they go to the oversight committee for approximately six to eight weeks to be scored. And then once that is done, it has to come before public safety to get uh, reviewed and approved. And then it has to go before full council. And then we have to start the grant signing workshops that are supposed to start in June so that funding can start in July. That's the funding period annually and what we've been uh, worked with the city manager's office to ensure that we kind of bumped that up because we were getting some complaints from the grantees that they weren't getting their money in July. So we wanted to make that uh, opportunity as efficient and effective as possible. So bumping that by a week could delay it to the point where if we can't get to uh, public safety or a full council before the break, now we're two months later. But what if you went the other direction? You allowed them to submit earlier. Then you would still have that length of time, but I would think that would be easier for you because it would extend the hours that your staff has to review these. And Mayor Williams, uh, totally understandable. Uh, as far as getting the guide at this point approved by public safety and then approved by council, which is set to be heard on October 3rd, I believe, uh, then having staff time to actually make all the changes that are approved and then get that posted in enough time for the grantees to be able to review it before the process opens. So we're kind of on a time crunch to make sure it all happens the way it's supposed to. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Councilmember Mendoza. Why are we getting rid of the appeal process? That would be the oversight committee. The decision. oversight committee at the request of um, we have in the past had the option of using a line item veto. And we would say that you, for example, cannot spay cats with, with the city's funding. Uh, that is no longer an option. And since the line item veto is no longer an option, the only reason, the only thing we have now is that your, your grant request met the guidelines of the number of points based on the scoring criteria that we use, or it didn't. And if it didn't meet the points on the scoring criteria, there is no recourse. The committee met, they reviewed. We review over 200 documents. They take a significant amount of time. The six to eight weeks that we have to review them is a lot of time. <laughs> and, uh, and we can't go back and change that. So either you met the scoring criteria or you didn't meet the scoring criteria. So there is nothing to appeal. Any other questions, council member? Any other questions, Mayor? Mm -hmm. Any closing remarks, Carmen? No. All right, well, thank you so much. And um, this is actually an uh, action item. I'll make the motion to uh, approve, send this forward to the council for approval with these amendments. 
Second that. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? May I say something? Absolutely. Sure. Thank you. The recommendations from the subcommittee is what the motion was made for, but there were also staff recommendations. Oh, that's right. Which one's conflicted? I've already forgotten. <laughs> page three, in the middle of the page. One through four. Staff's recommendations. Maybe, Carmen, if you could read them off for us. Mm -hmm. Happy to. Staff recommendation number one is to ensure applicants okay. have city staff assistance close the application process on Thursday, December 6th at 4 p.m. This is how the process has been done for the last several years to ensure city staff in the Neighborhood Services Department and the Police Department are available to assist grant applicants with successfully submitting their grant application electronically by the deadline. The committee had voted to move that to a Monday, and staff felt that that was putting a burden on the applicants, and the grantees would not have sufficient time to have get assistance. On number two, add language to the Oversight Committee scoring criteria document that line item vetoes on grant applications are prohibited. Remove all reference to vetoes from the application guide. While we uh, agreed that the veto is no longer an option, we did not remove the language when we did the application guide review. Number three is on page 10-11, remove the co-applicant meeting agenda requirement to make the application process less restrictive for applicants. In that case, we had the uh, uh, block, the, I'm sorry, Stacy, I just went blank. The, the police department folks. Mm -hmm. Yes, they. The wake up clubs, thank right, you. Wait, the wake right, up they clubs do not have home. agendas Mr. and it created Spur. an issue because by following the guidelines that we've established, we denied a lot of wake up clubs. Uh, and the fourth one is recommend that the Neighborhood Block Watch Oversight Committee review and or make changes to the grant application guide every three years to give grant applicants more consistency in the annual application process. Presently, we review the grant guide every two years. So this is stretching it out to three years. Uh, my personal opinion on this is that it gives it, a, if you're a new member of the committee, it's a very involved committee, uh, you may not have enough knowledge to actually do the review, where if you do it every three years, then you've been on the committee for a couple of years, a couple of terms already. Uh, we have, you know, as part of that, we do have the ability to still make uh, prohibited item changes and restricted item changes. Perfect. So we're not restricted. Thank you. My motion includes staff recommendations. The one through four, right? One through four. Perfect. I, I am a big believer in not allowing line item veto. Uh, if it is a prohibited item, I would think that would get zero scoring points, which is essentially the same thing, but it have, would be on our prohibited list. So. And if I may, Count, uh, Chair Malakowski and Mayor Williams, one of the things that uh, we have issues with, and, and, and it's just uh, just sharing our thoughts, is we have what we call the elephant on the request, which are things that are uh, we have an excellent grant request, only they also want to spay cats. And we don't think that spaying cats is part of a crime prevention process. And so that's where we would use a line item veto. But uh, now we're just going to grade the grant as a whole. Right. If it's a prohibited item, staff has already removed it from the grant. So I just wanted to share that. Well, on that particular topic, I'm sorry to take this much time. If you receive the number of calls that we receive, on feral cats and the damage they do in neighborhoods. Uh, I understand why some of the people put them in because they uh, really create havoc and according to some of the residents, uh, spread diseases within the neighborhood, so. Thank you. You touch a sensitive button. For I know. <laughs> I have one of those feral cats that hang around my house. I mean, Talk some people right. have 20, 30, 40 of them in a neighborhood. So Council Member Mendoza, are you um, okay with those? Um, yes. Add-ons? Yes. All right, so we have a motion and we have a second. Um, any discussion? The only thing I would add to that, to the discussion would be, is there training? I know that there's a lot of new block watch groups that are out there. Is there yes, training we do. on we, how to? The staff actually has at least two training sessions every, every grant period. Is it two or more? Yes, uh, Chairman Nowakowski, members of the subcommittee, we do actually uh, application workshops uh, during the application time when it's open. We also do workshops for the quarterly report process 
to ensure that each time a quarterly report is due, we meet with those members that want to meet with us. We're also available by phone, uh, and we walk people through the process pretty much every day on the phone. And the other thing is I know that District 4, 5, 7, and 8 have a lot of Spanish speaking, and we've been encouraging Spanish speaking block watches. Is there training in, in, in Spanish? So we do currently have a staff member that is fluent in Spanish. I'm not sure if she's actually certified, right. but she is fluent and she is there to help at the workshops. Okay, perfect. And can you pass those dates on to ourselves and to the rest of my colleagues so we can actually put in our newsletters Excellent. and let people know about that? With that, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we're on item number seven, the appointment of our Phoenix Municipal Court judges. If we can have the um, presiding judge maybe do us a little introduction. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, good morning. Um, we're embarking on something that the, the subcommittee and the council actually has not done in several years. The last recruitment that we had for uh, line judges at the municipal court was back in 2015. Um, there were some uh, significant changes to the, prog to the process that were made that are worth noting uh, as we go through what led up to being here today. Uh, at the council's request, uh, following some recruitments in 2015, there was some additional I would say transparency and openness factors added to uh, to the recruitment process that the court goes through. Um, we moved um, some of the functions that the Judicial Selection Advisory Board undertakes in this process for both the reappointment of previously appointed judges and the recruitment and appointment of new judges um, out of the city court over to uh, City Hall. Um, at the time, the idea was that that would make it a little more accessible because people didn't have to go through um, security like you do at the court. Uh, a little bit changed, obviously, with security, um, but having it here in City Hall, I think, is still a little more accessible. Um, the other thing that was a major change uh, is that in this round, for the first time, there was actually um, a, a, a live stream that went out um, of the Judicial Selection Advisory Board conducting the interviews that led to them um, selecting the seven candidates that they forward to you here today. Uh, those are available. Those are public for the first time. So it's a new transparency and a new openness to the to, um, to the, the process. Um, we undertook some other outreach activities that we haven't had before at the very beginning of this process. Uh, Councilman Nowakowski uh, and I actually hosted a get together. Uh, we put it out to uh, the bar associations statewide, and particularly the minority bar associations, to say, "Come on down, talk to us about what the process is. We really want to have." You know, great qualified applicants. It's a very open process. Um, we, I want to say we had about 30 people that came down for a, a great lunch hour talk about it with a lot of great questions. Um, so that's really kind of the intro of where we are today. Some changes to the process that I think have been positive. Um, but what you have in front of you are, are seven candidates that the Judicial Selection Advisory Board, after their vetting process, um, thought were the seven that they would um, forward to you for consideration for two vacancies that we need to fill on the municipal court bench. I'm open for any questions you might have. Um, Judge, we actually have eight, so was one of them? Um, one of the applicants um, actually uh, has withdrawn. Okay. Thank you. With that, I have some cards. Maybe we can listen to the cards and then call the. Mm -hmm. All right, Emilia? Come up to the microphone, you have two minutes. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, Chairman Nowakowski, good morning to um, Mayor. It's a pleasure for me to be here, and also uh, for the Vice Mayor and to Councilman uh, Mendoza. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Emilia Banuelos. I am an immigration attorney, and I have been here for the past uh, 25 years. I'm selling my 25th anniversary this year. Um, my office is on uh, 27th Avenue and I-17 in the city of Phoenix. Um, I'm here to um, recommend personally 
and also professionally uh, for for uh, Judge Anna Sanchez. I have known her for the past uh, 15 years. I find her um, to be doing a lot of pro bono work. I do a lot of uh, outreach with immigration communities and also with the homeless communities in, in the area that I am. And she is the person I always call, no matter what area of law, she is very open-minded. She's always, you know, I may not know that, but let me look it up or let me reach out to someone who I know. And she always, I could always count on her to be open-minded. And even though she doesn't have the answer, she will reach out to anyone and give me an answer. And she has become a very uh, reliable uh, person, a resource for me in helping out the community. Um, she has been in, in doing a lot of criminal work. Um, she also has, uh, she, d uh, she dabbles in different areas of pro bono. She does a lot, she's one of the most um, uh, reliable persons to do pro bono. And so I highly recommend her for this position. She is, um, I remember when I was in law school at ASU, the only female that I knew was Francisca Cota. And she was a judge and she lived in my, in my barrio, in my neighborhood in Peoria. And so that to me was eye-opening to have a female judge. And so to, for me to be able to have the opportunity to come and speak on her behalf, on behalf of Anna, and uh, recommend her, I, I think she'll be an asset to, to the uh, city of Phoenix and, and an asset as a judge, very open-minded. And she's probably, I like to promote myself as the hardest working attorney, but unfortunately, I think Anna beats me to it. Um, she's always going different places to talk about the community, about the legal community. And so I highly recommend uh, her for this position. And it's really a privilege that we have the opportunity to have such a well-rounded, open-minded, and dedicated person for this position. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Amelia. Next we have um, Leticia Hernandez. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leticia Hernandez, and I am also here to speak in favor of uh, Anna Sanchez. I've had the pleasure of knowing her for the past nine years um, as a person. Um, our relationship began uh, for representation purposes for one of my loved ones. Um, after um, getting to know her level of professionalism, um, it was a great experience. It was my first experience um, with criminal law. Uh, the process was uh, successful and in our favor. Um, then she went on to represent uh, my spouse in a case uh, three years. And um, she's just so professional, uh, open-minded, very reliable, um, always has um, above and beyond um, to resolve any matters. Um, and so I've known her for the past, uh, as I said, nine years. Um, and she is uh, just a wonderful person, very professional, and um, she would be a great candidate for this position. And I appreciate uh, the time that I am being given. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael Leon. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, Chairman, Councilwoman. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. I'm here to speak on behalf of Tom Paris Condola. I've known him over 20 years. He's a tremendous attorney. Uh, he's a very hard worker. Uh, he's done a lot of good for people in the community, not just as a defense attorney, but as a prosecutor as well. He's worked in many towns as a court-appointed defense attorney, uh, but also as a prosecutor. And that's ideal, I think, uh, when you're talking about becoming a judge. Um, so he's been working um, on both sides for quite a long time, and he's done a great job at it. Um, you know, speaking, uh, my wife, uh, Meg, some of you know much smarter than I am, she pointed out to me that, you know, when you talk about citizens from the community, um, some have contact with the executive branch, some with the legislative, but most of it really is with the judicial, as a defendant, as a victim, as a witness, uh, jurors. So that's really where people, when they uh, come into contact with government, it really is in the judicial system. Uh, quite a bit. So Tom has the temperament. Um, as long as I've known him, I've never seen him have a problem with any clients or any other litigants on the other side. Uh, he's born and raised here. Um, his office is in Phoenix, as is mine. Um, so I, I think the best thing that you can say about somebody uh, who wants to be a judge, having served six years myself on the Maricopa County Trial Court Commission, people looked for different things. 
uh, hard work ethic, uh, intellect. But I, I think his humility and his um, determination to treat people fairly, whether that be officers in the courtroom, whether that be witnesses, litigants, uh, victims, whoever, uh, I, can, I can say, and I think it's my best compliment for someone who wants to be a judge, I would feel good anybody that I know is a family member or friend, and they do come into the courtroom, that he would treat them well. Not everybody's going to be happy uh, because nobody, not everybody's happy in a criminal case, but he'll treat everybody well and they'll fel feel like they were listened to and they will feel like they were respected, and that's the best thing I could say. Thank you. Perfect timing. Also, um, Matthew, you seen, um supports Tom and, and just turning a card for favoring Tom. Matthew also put in a um, favoring um, Anna Sanchez. And Matthew also put in a card for um, James Tinker. Next is JJ Johnson. Uh, Mayor, uh, Chairman, uh, in the 10 years that I've worked as a criminal defense investigator, I've come in contact with a lot of different uh, uh, people. I wanted to tell you a little bit about Frankie Jones. Uh, I met Frankie Jones when she was the bureau chief uh, in the probation division at, uh, uh, with the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. We had a client with a constellation of issues and instead of just looking at that person as, you know, well, you know, this has been the offense conduct, this is what uh, we have to look forward to, she asked an interesting question. She said, how can this be the last time that we have contact with this individual in the criminal justice system? And she really started working through <coughs> Uh, different ways of uh, looking at that individual and what they could offer to help that person move through uh, the system. That person uh, did end up going to prison uh, but is back out after a very short stint and is doing fine now and she recognized that. Um, I think her judgment and her willingness to look at individuals is very, very important and she would make a good judge. Uh, Tom Periscondola, who was just who was just mentioned, uh, I had a case with him. In he was the prosecutor in the Cave Creek, uh, in the Cave Creek uh, uh, court, and he also looked at the individual and really carried out his duties as a minister of justice. Uh, both Frank and uh, both Frankie and Tom would work hard to be the fair-minded person that we need in Phoenix City Court. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Next would be Lisa Loon. Good morning, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Frankie Jones. I want to stress I'm here in my personal capacity. Uh, I am a practicing attorney um, in town. I was also the past president of the State Bar of Arizona. I mention that because that's relevant to my comments about Frankie uh, and how I know Frankie. Uh, I also would also disclose that uh, 16 years ago, I was on the other side. I was a candidate for the court as well, um, and I've been a pro had been a pro tem, so I'm very familiar with the court. So I speak from um, that knowledge. So um, y y all of your candidates are qualified. There's no doubt about that. So what I don't share with you is my experience with Frankie and what her contributions could be to this court. It's a high volume court. No doubt about it. Unlike Superior Court, it moves cases high docket. You need someone who's going to be able to move that, and Frankie has that experience. But you also need someone who's not going to be robotic, someone who's going to be able to interface with all the defendants and with the prosecutors to ensure that all the parties have equal access to justice. And Fra um, I've seen that with Frankie because I've seen her on state bar committees. Um, I reappointed her, and I actually appointed her as chair of the Unauthorized Practice of Law Committee. During a time when our Supreme Court was undergoing, excuse me, um, some governance and reorganization issues with the State Bar. Appointed her to chair that committee uh, on Unauthorized Practice of Law, then she worked on the task force with the Supreme Court. Stepping back to say, what can we do to improve justice? not just looking at the status quo and saying this is fine, 
but looking at what it is the judicial system and the legal system needs to do and to change to ensure that there's justice. I was impressed, I was proud of how Frankie represented the bar on these task forces. I think you will find that she will carry out that same um, conviction to justice with this court and understand that's high volume. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next would be um, Jean Dyers. Good morning, everyone. I'm Janine Dyer. I'm an attorney, and I'm giving my comments um, as a personal friend of Frankie Jones in support of her application. Um, I haven't practiced with her per se. I don't uh, practice criminal defense. How I know Frankie is that I first met her um, due to my membership with the Arizona Black Bar, and then I had an opportunity to serve in leadership with her as well. I'm the immediate past president of the Arizona Black Bar. What I know about Frankie, first, I mean, you've already heard all these wonderful statements about her. She is an amazing person. If you have not had the opportunity to meet her, if you do, you will also find that she is an amazing person. Um, Frankie is the kind of person that she doesn't just look at an issue and let it go. Um, when she has a concern about an issue, she looks to see how she can fix it. Within the Arizona Black Bar, we were concerned about the bar passage rate in Arizona. So instead of us just sitting around and figuring out, like, do we help law students? What do we do? Do we further connect with the law students? Frankie applied to be on the um, Board of Examinations to determine, to get a better look at the issue to see if the, um, if the exam is too hard, what are the, um, how are people getting into law school, what are the standards, what is actually the problem? So, and that's basically the tone of her life and in her career. She sees an issue and she looks to see how can I make it better? We've had a concern um, within all the minority bars, we, and she's been working with me in that capacity, I think, for like the last three years. We had a concern about um, a lack of diversity on the bench, and so Frankie, um, she's been involved with the Commission of Minorities on the Judiciary. She has, uh, she distinguished herself in that, so now she's the chairperson of that committee. She's also worked with me and the other bar organizations to, um, put forth CLEs to encourage people to apply and also inform them of what is necessary to be a stellar applicant in the judicial process. So I strongly support Frankie. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our last card is Mrs. Hart. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, Chairman, Mayor Williams, uh, Vice Mayor Waring, and Councilwoman Mendoza. Welcome to the group. Um, I'm here to speak personally and uh, for a friend, but I have to agree with Lisa that you have a really great group of applicants uh, here. And uh, I'm here to speak for Jim Tinker. Uh, Jim uh, has served as a pro tem in a number of Valley cities from Phoenix to surprise in size. And um, he uh, has been a former assistant prosecutor for the city. He has been a private lawyer he has uh, an MBA. I mean, he's, he's a widely varied guy. But what is most uh, impressive to me about Jim is his temperament, excuse me, his temperament. He has, so Jim uh, is an enrolled member of the Osage uh, uh, Indian tribe in uh, Oklahoma. He was not raised on the uh, reservation because he's a, a military brat. He traveled around with his dad and his mom, and he um, remains so, however, enrolled in his family in uh, Oklahoma and the tribe. He has a special understanding for people of different cultures, um, not just Native Americans, but others who come before the court, and I have heard them talk to him uh, and appreciate what he has done for them. So I just, I just want to relay to you in this group that you have a really special candidate in Jim. Uh, I think he is extraordinarily qualified and has uh, an interest in helping people at this very earliest stage of their interaction with the court system to do better and improve and, uh, 
and, uh, and get out of their trouble and, and, and into a better life. Thank you. Thank you so much. And can we have our first applicant, David, come in? Good morning. So basically, David, um, you can just tell us a little bit about yourself and and why do you want to be a judge? Thank you. Well, as you know, my name is David Allen, David James Allen II. Uh, I am a longtime Phoenix resident. I've built my life here, despite what I say every summer about the heat. It is my home. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am interested in becoming a city judge in, in this particular court. I'm currently serving as an administrative law judge for the state. I want to become a judge here because it is where I've, as I've said, built my home. I do enjoy public service, the challenges and the rewards. And I feel that sitting as a judicial officer is the best way in which I can serve my community based on my training and experience as a trial attorney and as a judicial officer in other courts. I've been interested in the city of Phoenix court because of the city's reputation, the court's reputation for innovation, uh, its openness uh, and its reputation for its professionalism and fairness to the public. That is why I'm interested, particularly in this court. And do we have any other questions, any questions to ask David? Oh. Okay, I don't know if that was the only question I can expand upon it, but I <laughs> figured you had more, so I was trying to different size. <laughs> ask a question. Absolutely. Why Dutch? Dutch. <laughs> uh, my dad was in the service, uh, and I was, uh, he was stationed in northern Germany, and we did not live far from the Dutch border, such as living here with a bilingual community. And uh, as a child, I couldn't quite understand why I could understand some people, and other people was a little bit harder. And then so I, as an adult, I said, I'm going to master that language. And so I learned Dutch, and I have not used it since. <laughs> <laughs> Son who's very interested in many languages, so I was just curious. I'm like, that's one maybe I'll suggest to him then. Thank you. Did you want to continue? I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. With the, the Dutch question or why I wish you'd like to be a judge? I want to clarify. I don't want to waste your time answering the wrong question. Oh, why do you want to be a judge? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> as I was saying, I enjoy the challenges of public service, the, uh, the challenges and the rewards. That's why when I started my career, I went into criminal justice, worked as a prosecutor, advanced through that position. Uh, and the next step in my career was to become a judicial officer with the state of Arizona. And I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, I felt that it allowed me to better serve my community by making sure that I held myself to the highest standards every day. Uh, and as a judge, you can't make sure that everyone leaves your courtroom happy. Someone is going to be unhappy about something that happened. But it's my personal mission and my professional mission to make sure that everyone leaves after a proceeding that I've adjudicated in, feeling at least they were heard, that they felt the system served its purpose. It provided a forum in which they could bring their grievances and have them resolved in a safe, open environment where they knew the rules, they knew that the rules were being fairly and equally applied. That's why I want to be a judge. I feel like if people do not believe that they have a place in society where they can come and be heard and know that they would be treated with dignity and respect, then the system begins to break down. And so that's why I want to be a judge, to serve my part, to ensure that our community can move forward in that respect. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your personal life? Yes. Family, hobbies? I have, um, I have lots of hobbies. <laughs> uh, my friends often make fun of them for uh, me. I am an avid reader, but uh, with my schedule, I don't get time to read, so I listen to audiobooks. So my friends always ask me every day, what are you reading? And <laughs> <laughs> I still think it, sound, it counts as reading. It's intellectual development and simulation. I spend uh, most of my free time, I've uh, become very involved in my community. I volunteer with an organization called Ignite Your Status. It's a community outreach organization. Uh, so it's become both my volunteer work and my socialization, uh, not to go too far deep into what the program does or on a daily basis, but they do community HIV education and uh, to remove the stigma since people naturally, because of the social stigma, don't want to go to a free clinic or speak to the doctor about certain things. They set up educational booths in the community at bars, street fairs and events like that. I'm one of the people that go and volunteer and man the booths to provide the information. So it's a built-in socialization. I'm doing community service and I get to be somewhere fun. And that's what I spend most of my weekends doing because it's rewarding. I have uh, dogs. I'm, I enjoy doing pet rescue. Um, 
Just and, that uh, point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All I right. currently have two rescues. He's coming and in first right now. <laughs> <laughs> Depending what time we finish here today, I might be going to get another one. I got the message that there was another dog that needed a home, and I am a sucker for a sad doggy story. Uh, that's what I do. I'm trying to curtail that, or I will become the crazy guy with 20 dogs <laughs> in my house. I'm trying to limit it to two, <laughs> and it keeps creeping up. Uh, but that is mostly what I spend my, my spare time doing. I, uh, I have a younger brother who is uh, approximately half my age, and I've helped raise him. And, Recently moved him into my home to teach him some independence and uh, move him into adulthood. And so that means every day I'm calling my parents and thanking them for not killing me and letting me make it to adulthood because I see the things he did when I was his age. A little background of who I am as a whole person. I love my family. I love my community. And I love my dogs. And uh, they're, they're my respite when I get overwhelmed or stressed in my personal life. Those are the things I retreat to. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Mendoza. Tell us about an innovative idea you have had and been able to bring to fruition during your career. Uh, an innovative idea I've had, it was actually early on in my career. Um, as uh, Vice Mayor Waring asked about languages, I also sign. Uh, and I was when I was living and working in Tucson, I noticed that there were legal aid and legal referral communities or uh, clinics that specialized in uh, different communities. Uh, there was a homeless clinic, a domestic violence legal clinic, um, several other tent clinics, an immigration law clinic, and I noticed that there was not one for the deaf legal community, or the deaf community, but there was a deaf outreach center. Uh, and I found that there was, because of the language barrier access, there were members of that community that were not getting basic legal information that I felt that they needed. So I, and I was also studying sign language at the time. My minor was in special education in the deaf studies program. So I used the resources that were available to me, and I set up a legal program uh, for the interpreters, using the interpreters that are in the special education program, they have to do so many hours for a practicum. So I made arrangements that they could get those clinical hours by providing interpreting services. I then reached out to the legal aid attorneys in my community and established a legal aid clinic uh, that, as far as I know, is still running in a very different format than I established it. But that was something I felt was innovative. I made use of available resources because we were not grant funded and there was no monies available. So I pulled it together on the wish and a prayer and a shoestring budget. But, so, David, I have a question. Is so, um, what work or training have you participated in to help you develop or understand the whole diversity within the city of Phoenix? Okay, if you could repeat the question for me, please. Basically, what work or um, training have you participated in to allow you to develop an understanding of the diversity within our city? Okay, thank you. Uh, in terms of work, I've I began my career. Uh, the, professional part of my career as an attorney, as a trial attorney with the county attorney's office. Uh, eventually, I worked my way into the major crimes division, starting with the, uh, the misdemeanor division, or bureau, as it's sometimes called, prelim bureau, and working my way up. In there, uh, in that capacity, I faced the public on a daily basis. So I had on-the-job job training and specific course training on how to best serve the public. Uh, some of it I thought was intuitive, but that specific training for me, it helped me put into perspective that my worldview may not be the worldview or the daily view of those that I'm coming into contact with. And it taught me to be clear in my explanations, to understand that what I can just have as an assumption may be brand new information for someone else. And if I want to make sure they understand the process, their rights, and that they feel that they were heard, then I need to, if I can't understand where they're coming from, at least acknowledge that they are in a different place than I am and see what steps and resources are available to help them ensure that they have access to the resources that I'm trying to share with them. And that's some of my training that helps me I believe, be someone that is sensitive and aware and uh, functional within a diverse community, recognizing that there is diversity within our community and that it should be embraced. Any other questions? Yeah, I do have one. Oh, all right. You were a sole practitioner, but you gave that up. Yes. Um, you've been in your present position like eight months or Correct. something. Why did you give up being a sole practitioner? Give the counselor so committee a completely honest answer. It was financial. I enjoyed it, the freedom of it, but there was, it's feast or famine. Uh, uh, it came time to renew my health insurance, and when I saw it was going to be $600 a month to take care of just myself, I said, I love the freedom, and also, uh, but I, to be perfectly honest, it was my, primarily a financial decision. It just, it was not sustainable, um, but I also found it was very lonely. I'm a more of a social person than I would have given myself credit for. As a sole practitioner, I got a lot, a lot of work done. I helped a lot of people, but it's meant spending a lot of time alone in an office, sitting in a Starbucks, which was also not healthy for my wallet or my waistline because I would sit there and buy snacks while I was working. Uh, and I felt that I could better serve the community in a public service position. 
again, I helped all my clients. I enjoyed that reward of helping them find resolution to what they're working on. But I felt that my ability to help people was limited to one person at a time. Uh, and that just wasn't something I was interested in maintaining long term. Mr. Chair, I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Oh, that's I right. do it appreciate your candor. Um, I appreciate that you're, you're honest about it. Thank you. David, any closing remarks? Very briefly, thank you, each of you, for this opportunity. I'm honored to be here. I don't envy the position that each of you are in, uh, but I want to say thank you again for this opportunity. I look forward uh, to the possibility of being selected as a candidate for the uh, judicial officer for this position. It's one that I, I think that I would do well in. I have worked my entire career towards this moment, and I thank you, and I respectfully ask that I be nominated. Thank you so much. Thank you. You folks have a good day. Okay. Is it Carla? Taking her out of the vault. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Carla, how you doing? Good, thank you. Great. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you want to be a, a judge? Okay. Um, obviously, my name is Carla Bastine, and um, I grew up in Page, Arizona. I um, I went to U of A for, for college and for law school, and um, I came from a working class family. My dad um, and my mom actually grew up in Missouri in homes that had no running water. Um, they, uh, my dad quit school when he was 13 years old and went to work in the oil field and was able to work his way up from being just, they call them roughnecks when they first start in the oil field doing the grunt work. And then he was a consultant by the time he retired from that. Um, so I grew up in a, a blue collar family, um, working hard. And um, I was the first person in my family to go to college and the only one that's ever gone to law school. And so it was a lot of family support, my mother in particular, um, really pushing me and supporting me to, to do something um, bigger and better. And um, I spent, uh, well, I started working as an attorney in Page, Arizona. I went back there after I graduated from law school, and I did prosecution there. Um, I came to Glendale, worked as a prosecutor for the city of Glendale for a total of about eight years, and I also worked for the City of Surprise um, as a prosecutor and also doing some of the civil um, city side stuff, um, and that was for about two years. And then I went back to Glendale after um, Surprise. Um, in 2009, I opened my own practice, and I became a criminal defense attorney. I first got the contract with Maricopa County um, doing felony public defense work, and then I um, was asked by both Surprise and Glendale to apply for the public defender contracts there because they knew me from when I was prosecuting there. So I, I at this point, have the felony OPDS contract, um, a, a public defense contract with Glendale, and also one with Surprise. and. Um, I've been doing that since 2009, so I've done, I've been an attorney since 1996, so basically around 10 years in each side of the, the gamut, and that has taught me how the, the court system works. I've been primarily a courtroom attorney, not um, as much behind the scenes, but in the courtroom doing jury trials, uh, both felony and misdemeanor doing um, motion hearings, writing motions, um, arguing them, uh, doing pretrial conferences. And then as a private attorney, I've even done some civil traffic. I've done um, order of protection hearings, things like that. And I believe that all of that experience that I've had on both sides has prepared me for kind of taking the next step in my career. And so I would like to become a judge so that I can use the things that I've learned about the criminal justice system and about how things are supposed to work and 
about the, the players and, and the people that are involved, and I can take that there and hopefully um, do justice for the community and, and make the community a better place. Perfect, thank you. Any questions for Carla? Mayor? Uh, uh, could you tell us about uh, your personal community life? Uh, what do you do? Sure. For fun. <laughs> Well, I'm, um, I'm a single mother. I have three boys. Um, my oldest is 21, and he's in the Coast Guard now in Kodiak, Alaska. And then I have a, an 18-year-old that just graduated from high school who's still at home. And then uh, my youngest is 14, and he just started high school. And um, he's doing cross-country, so I spend a lot of time going to cross-country meets um, to watch him. Um, prior to that, my other boys were involved in wrestling and in track and in football. And so we spent a lot of time at sporting events, running from place to place, going to Winslow for wrestling tournaments and things like that. Um, I have, I, I love dogs, I, or just animals in general. So I have five dogs, um, they're all rescue dogs, and I have um, a potbelly pig named George Hamilton. And... <laughs> Did you cue the man or what? <laughs> I like to spend time with my, my animals, my boys, and my mom and dad also live with me now. They moved in about a year and a half ago um, because my father has Alzheimer's. And so I help with, with taking care of him. Um, he's probably in the middle, late middle stages of Alzheimer's, so he still knows who we are most of the time and everything, but he can't be left alone or anything along those lines. So I try to give my mom as much of a break as I can and spend as much quality time with my dad as, as is possible. Um, I also have done fostering for, um, it was called Helping Orphaned Hounds, but when my parents moved in, that became kind of overwhelming. And um, I have done, I did a mission trip to Mexico where we went to the barrio in Mazatlan and took school supplies and um, clothes and toys and things like that to the children. Um, I actually fostered a child who was my, my middle son's best friend, and his mother was um, a severe alcoholic, and the police actually found him living in a home by himself with no running water. And he called, uh, he, the only person he could think of that he had a phone number for was my son Jackson, so he had the police call them. And my ex-husband's actually a, a good friend of mine too, but he, um, the, the boys were with him, and they knew the name, so they, the police, in surprise, called my ex-husband and told him what was going on. So we ended up taking him into our house, and he lived with us for about four months until I checked with people from my church and different things to try to find a foster home for him that was more suitable because my kids were going back and forth between me and my, my ex-husband and just a lot of things going on, and he was going to another high school that he had to... We had to make special arrangements to get him there, and so we found a foster home for him um, that was in right by his high school, and I met the lady, and he's just flourished there. He's actually started U of A, and he's a journalism major, and so in spite of the, his mother did pass away, so in spite of everything, um, he was able to, to move on. So I, I guess in general, I, I just help any way that I can. I like to be around people. I like to meet new people. I like to do whatever I can to help the community. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilmember Mendoza. Tell us about an innovative idea you have had and been able to bring to fruition during your career. Well, I've, as I stated, I worked for the city of Glendale for um, for quite a long time, and um, basically they, they do, I think they do jail court very similarly to the way that the city of Phoenix does it, but you get cases the, the day before, and you don't have um, really an opportunity to, re to review them or anything like that, and I had um, suggested at my job in Glendale that it would be better if one person were assigned to jail court, maybe rotating out, but not having a different attorney go in there every day. One thing you see 
a lot of the same people coming back. And so if you kind of know what's going on, um, it, it makes it easier to structure things, to get a hold of victims and, and things along that line. And it was a um, at least a six month period of time right before I left that they allowed me to go in and take over jail court. And it just made it run much more smoothly. It, it helped with the continuity with jail courts sort of an, an odd situation where things just happen and you're, you have to be able to think on your feet. And so that was something that I was able to implement for at least a time period in Glendale that I believe helped the situation. Council member Imwari. So you've been a criminal defense attorney and a prosecutor, which did you like more? You know, there was, I, initially I thought that I wanted to be a prosecutor for my entire career and switching to defense was, was sort of a, a necessity because when I went back to Glendale, um, the, the city attorney had decided that all people coming into the city prosecutor's office would be on three year contracts. And when I went back in, I had a lot of experience and so they were paying me for my experience. And when my three-year contract was up, I went to them before it was up to find out if they were going to renew it or not, because I was the first one that went through that process. And basically, they could hire somebody fresh out of law school and pay them half of what they were paying me. And so that was the decision that they made, because it was right during the um, housing crisis. And there had also been a lot of stuff that happened with the Coyotes Arena, so Glendale was really hurting for money. So I, I had to start looking for a job, and I interviewed at a lot of different places. But the AG's office, the county attorney's office, the all of the cities, everybody ended up with a hiring freeze right at that time period. So I had, there was no government job that I could go to, really. And so then I found out about the OPDS contract, which was a felony contract. Um, that was also the time period when I was I had just gone through my divorce. And so I had three boys that I had to figure out a way to support. So I was sort of forced into doing the criminal defense. But it's honestly been an amazing experience because I've met a lot of people who I heard their stories and I heard what they go through and how they kind of ended up in the situation that they're in. And there's a lot of suffering people out there, a lot of people with mental illness. Um, a lot of people with PTSD from the military and things like that. And so being a defense attorney isn't so much about just getting the person off of the charge. Sometimes they are, they are definitely innocent and, you know, you prevail at trial and, and things along those lines. But a lot of times it's just advocating for them and explaining who they are and where they came from and the extenuating circumstances and also recognizing the mental illness and the, the issues that the people are dealing with and sharing that with the other side so that justice can be done because it's not about convictions or wins, it's about doing what's right and about helping the community, about helping the people who are in a situation where they're committing offenses to not do that again and address the issues that are, that are underlying there as well as it is about protecting victims from being victims in the first place. And so I, I really, I don't like either side more. I, I really think that they're both essential, that, they're, that they both have wonderful qualities. And I'm, I'm actually thankful that my job ended and I was forced into it because I don't think I ever would have experienced the things that I've experienced otherwise. I have a question. So what work or training have you participated in to allow you to develop the understanding of the, this diverse city that we live in? So I, I was a, um, when, when I first started, I did a lot of coverage work. And a couple of the attorneys who have contracts with the city of Phoenix, I covered for them. So I did pretrials. Um, some of the private attorneys who had matters there, I also covered for them. And then prior to the last um, process of the, the interviews, I actually went with one of the public defenders who I also work with in Glendale and Surprise and shadowed her and saw her in custody docket and then her out of custody docket to kind of see how the process works. I've talked to some of the judges, um, James Hernandez, I've spoken with him about just the process and how things work, but um, being 
in the two other courts, Surprise and, and Glendale, I, I have the ability to basically pop in anywhere and kind of understand how things work. I've seen the felony side, I've seen the misdemeanor side, and so I feel that um, as far as the city of Phoenix goes, I know how to do the work. What I'm excited about is that Phoenix is very innovative in the programs that they're offering. The um, Veterans Court and the Mental Health Court, I would love to be involved in those processes. I, right now, I've covered for Mental Health Court in Glendale several times. I'm kind of the, the go-to if the other two people aren't available. And if people are not eligible for Mental Health Court, Glendale actually assigns them to me to determine if I think that they can go forward in the regular process or if they need a Rule 11 evaluation. If they need the Rule 11 evaluation in Glendale, I send them to the attorney that, that handles those. So I, I deal a lot with mental health, and, and I actually have a passion for that, partly because of my dad and, and his Alzheimer's. Um, but just seeing those people suffer, and it's something that they didn't ask for, but they need assistance with, and a lot of times the underlying cause is that they need medication or that they need some sort of treatment that they're not getting or that they don't have the funds to get or that they've lost their access. And, and so I really like the fact that, that Phoenix has been such a forward mover in the mental health court area. And then with the veterans, um, as I stated before, I've seen so many clients who have PTSD from serving their country, from, from doing the honorable thing, but they're suffering because of it. And it leads to a lot of criminal activity, either self-medicating through substances or, or having PTSD where the smallest thing can set them off and they feel that um, they're being attacked and then they'll react in a way that's not um, acceptable legally. And so I would really love to be involved with those innovative programs that Phoenix has kind of been at the forefront in creating. Any other questions? You have some time to wrap up if there's some closing I just, comments. I would, thank you. I would like to just thank everybody for, for listening to me, for taking the time. And I just feel that it's an honor to be considered amongst such a prestigious group of people that, that are, are being uh, interviewed by the panel. And so I'd just like to thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Frankie's next. Hi, Frankie. How you doing? Good morning. Good. So just tell us a little bit about yourself and why would you like to be a judge? Well, I originally I was born and raised in New York, and uh, when I'm about 10 years old, my parents got a job and moved to Nebraska. So I actually I finished junior high and high school, and I went to college there. That's so when I went to college and law school, and that's where I met my husband in undergrad. Um, Michael and we've been married for 26 years so uh, and he's a native of Phoenix and so that's how I ended up here in Phoenix Arizona uh, we are the proud parents of two sons our oldest son is active duty Air Force he's in Japan right now he came home for a few weeks uh, in July and then our youngest son Christopher is up at NAU so uh, change this major but hopefully looks like uh, graduation hopefully this spring uh, when I was in school, I was a political science major um, and minored in business. Why I'm interested in being a judge, um, I mean, you've seen my application. I've been an attorney for 24 years. Uh, during that time, I, I first started out, I did immigration law and uh, some criminal defense. And for the last 20 years, I've been a deputy county attorney, and I've worked in various capacities in our office. I've, I've handled all types of felony cases, and I've also been a supervisor for the last 14 years and I supervised our younger attorneys and our probation violation bureau I did that for 13 years 
And while I was there, I was in charge of our specialty courts, and that was drug court, DUI court, domestic violence court, mental health court, and veterans court. And every assignment that I've had, I've, it has helped me to prepare for being a judge. Because one of the things as a prosecutor and as an attorney, you have to make decisions. And I don't look at just, it's a case, I look at these are people. And what I'm doing, I'm affecting somebody's life, whether it's the defendant in the case, whether it's a victim in the case, uh, every witness that perhaps has to testify at trial, a jury that has to come in, it's affecting lives. So it's not just a CR number or a JC number, a TR number, but these are people's lives that are affected. And I've always looked at that. And every decision has to be made in that fashion. And I always remember that it's people. And that's, I don't take that lightly. I feel that's a, that's a duty and it's an honor, but that's a, a serious thing to consider. Um, other things that I've done over the years I've been able to as I serve um, on the state bar committees and I have a heart for people and helping and to make things better. I always want to look at how we can improve and that's one of the reasons why I worked like on our unauthorized practice of law and committees of that nature because I want to make the bar better to help make the bench better. It's always of trying to improve. Uh, in, I've been a member of the Commission on Minorities Commission and one of that is to look at diversifying and training for the bench and also staff. And we look at how we can uh, improve things and trainings and encouraging those who want to go to law school. And we recently had a training uh, with law students and undergraduate students. We had a conference back in April and it was encouraging them to be judges, but how to become judges and what it is they got to interact with judges uh, from various parts of the bench, from the appellate court, from the Supreme Court, the city court, superior court, and also justice of the peace. But it's always looking, I want to look at how we can do things better. And that's always what I strive for, is to improve things. Any questions for my colleagues? Uh, ask my regular question. Right Tell there. us about uh, your personal life. What do you like? What do you do? Recreation, hobbies, etc. One thing I like to do is I like to work with students. That's one of my passions. Um, I think back when I first got interested in law school, because my parents weren't in law, it was in eighth grade and it was a school teacher after studying the Constitution. That's what got me interested. So I've always enjoyed teaching. If I wasn't practicing law, that's probably what I would do. So I always like to do things. I can kind of combine the two together. And so I enjoy working with students. So a lot of times um, I work with junior high students. Now I'm working, uh, we just started, uh, ASU has a pipeline program and I'm very excited. I've always coached, or not coached, uh, judged for the moot courts, but this time I'm actually going to coach a team, so I'm really excited. Um, my school is Carl Hayden, so I was teasing my colleagues. I said, you know, we can have a little bet on Starbucks or who's going to win, but I'm, I'm, you know, rooting my, bringing my team on as we get ready for the moot court competition in November. So uh, I, en I enjoy doing that because I think, um, Children are the future, so I'm always excited. And I did that with my own sons. I mean, I always say charity starts at home. So I start with them and make sure they were, and to live an example that they could follow. So I'm always the same person. What you see at home is what you're going to see in court, what you see at me at work. And so I enjoy working with children in that fashion because I want to be someone that they can be inspired to say, you know what, I might want to do that. All right, and that might be something I would like to do and here's how to do that. So I, I like doing that. Um, one of the things is I'm one of the children's choir director at my church. So uh, my children are ages uh, five to 10. So on youth Sundays that you'll see me uh, directing the choir. Actually, youth Sunday is coming up this Sunday. So that was, uh, we were rehearsing on last week. Uh, and that's something I've always been passionate about. I've been a director for probably like 10 years or so and uh, teach the Sunday school classes at my church. So I'm uh, very committed to that. Thank you. Councilmember Mendoza. Tell me about tell me about an innovative idea you've had that you've been able to implement in your career. We had an issue come up one time and our calendars were getting congested in our, our regular probation violation calendars, because they run all day. We have several. They run 8.30. At that time, they ran 8, 11, and 2. And they're very high volume calendars. And so we got together on the committee. It was the committee, uh, committee of myself, 
uh, the public defender and probation and the court. And so we got together and said, well, let's see how we can try to streamline things because it seems like it was taking us a very long time um, to get through our calendars and it seems like we were, morale was getting low because it was so wearing and just taxing on people. So we got together and we said, well, how about if we just change the start times? We'll start, a lot of times people are still not ready at 8. Let's just start at 8.30. Let's start this calendar at this time and let's try this and let's move our difficult cases to an afternoon so we have more time to deal with them. So that way if there are victims that are present, they have more time to present their cases. Um, if it's a case where the uh, defendant is bringing in other people to speak on his or her behalf, they have plenty of time to do it and we're not rushed because we're trying to get through a 1030 calendar. And after we did that, we noticed things ran a lot smoother. Uh, we seem to move faster and just also just the morale of the attorneys and the probation officers it was like this this is a good thing to do so it's it just looking just a small change but it was getting together let's see how we can fix this thank you um, councilmember Waring already I have one um, so what work or training have you participated in to allow you to develop an understanding of the diversity mm -hmm. of the city of Phoenix community well, everything that I've done, first, like I said, I, I'm on the Commission on Minorities. And with that, that's commit, uh, consisted of myself. I'm now the, the chairperson of it, but I've been a member of that for the last five or six years. And it's looking at all angles of the bench and looking at how to improve things in every, every aspect. Um, other things that I've done, because I've worked for the last 14 years in all of our specialty courts, because we look at post-sentencing. Um, you always look at, well, yeah, you can sentence a person because they've committed a crime, but you want to figure out, well, what, what happened or how can I get them to not to commit this again? Or what, what's really behind this? Is there a substance abuse issue? Is there uh, there's anger management? Is something that we can get to the root of that we can change? If we can change the behavior, then we can change the person. And then you don't see the person back again and that that should be the ultimate goal is we want to change the behavior and so in the last few years that's what we've done in all of our specialty courts we looked at the best practices um, I not only supervised those courts but I also covered those courts so I experienced firsthand so I didn't just listen to what my attorneys would tell me I would actually be there to see what would work and we said well let's let's see what partners we can get available for example, example in drug court and DUI court those courts work because you have the partners in the community that can provide the substance abuse and the counseling. We looked, okay, well, who can we get? How many can we get? What type, you know, what's available? The mental health the same way. If we're looking at their mental health issues, well, what do we have available? Because that's what's going to make it, make it work. It's not just a court effort, but it's a community effort. And we realize that's what it takes. We, we can say and do things in a court of law, but it takes a community. It's kind of like the, the old saying, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes the community to keep the community. Well, thank you, Frankie. Any? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There is I do question. have one. All righty. I was curious about these things. Uh, so you've been in your current position, your current employer, in 20 years? 20 years. 20 and a half, actually. 20 and a half years. Um, <laughs> any regrets about leaving? I mean, that's a long time to be vested in one organization. Um, I'm just curious your thoughts. No, you know, it, it's not, um, any, anytime there's a change, of course, you think about it. But I think back, you know, I started in the city of Phoenix. My very first jury trial was in the city of Phoenix. It was a solicitation case, and then my second jury trial was a DUI trial. Uh, at the county attorney's office, we are the conflict office for the city prosecutor's office. When they have a conflict, we get, we get their cases to handle. And so over the years, we've actually handled cases. I, I have one recently. Uh, that's set uh, for trial. One of my attorneys had one. So we're always in the city of Phoenix. Um, so no, I don't have any regrets because I look at, you're here for, this is purpose. I mean, I've been there obviously a long time and I've had the experience to do what I've done and I'm proud to, you know, have done that. But I don't have any reservations because I look at being a judge, everything that I've done has prepared me for that. So I don't have any Regrets. I've learned from my job. I've enjoyed every day. Sure, it's been tough. There's sometimes there are cases that are tough. There are uh, situations that we deal with uh, that did, that we didn't learn in law school. But no, I wouldn't have any reservations. The reason I ask is just you know obviously if you stay somewhere 20 years, that's the bulk of your time out of law school. Um, that must have been purposeful. 
And so I, it implies to me that you must have had a, a mission over there um, and that you must be making a transition for a reason. That sounds like the reason is because maybe you always wanted to be a judge. Is that a fair statement? It's fair. I have, you know, I thought about that. But also, I look at, you have to be prepared for what you do. You just can't go out and do something, even if you say, this is what I would like to do. You have to be prepared to do it. There are a lot of people that will make a decision, and they'll go do something, and then realize you really weren't prepared to do that. You probably need to wait and get some experience. So when situations come up, because you're going to get things in life, that is what has taught me. Because uh, I not only have been an attorney, but I've been a manager. So I've had to deal with budgets. I've had to deal with staff. I've had to deal with employees. I've had to deal with disciplinary matters. So there's a lot of things that it taught me. And also, just as a mother uh, and with dealing with children, I've learned how I've dealt with people. And that's one thing as a judge, you're going to be, I deal with people. And that's not, that's not something I ever would take lightly. That was actually excellent life advice. I might tape that and play that for candidates who come to me and say, I'd like to run for office. <laughs> <Sometimes>. <laughs> Little, little electoral humor there, but uh, thank you. I think I'm, I'm good. Thanks, guys. Um, Frankie, any closing remarks? You know, first of all, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I don't take this lightly. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, I know you've looked at my application and the other applicants as well and uh, seen the qualifications. Um, but one of the things I just want to tell you, and you can read what's on the paper and obviously see the experience, but it comes from the heart. And I've had a, I have a heart for people. I don't do something just because I want to do it. Everything that I've always done, whether I'm working as an attorney, uh, whether I was sitting at my son's basketball games, driving the team to practices back and forth, cheering them on, um, everything that I do when I'm you know, teaching my Sunday school class, uh, when I'm talking to the, the attorneys or the staff, everything I do, every every any. Um, at, seminars that I've presented, anything, I do it because I want to do it because I want to make things better. I always see if there's a problem, I want to solve it. I don't do something just because I want to, but because I have a heart to do it and a heart for people. Thank you so much. Thank you. And at this time, I think we're going to take a two to three minute recess.